All right, so last section we're going to look at for this week is 1.6. And basically what's in this section um, is how we can take two different functions, or two different formulas, and combine them together to create a new formula. The most basic ways you can combine functions together are adding, subtracting, multiplying, and dividing. So if you had something like f of x, this is a real simple, equals x squared, g of x equals 5x squared. One way I could combine those to create a new function would be to use addition. I could take the two separate functions, I could add them together and create the function 6x squared. That's an example of creating function, creating a new function with addition. Now, sometimes, um, like here, it lucked out, I had like terms I could combine. Sometimes when you add two functions together, there's nothing to really simplify because they're not like terms. I gave you guys an example where they were. All right, so here's another one. These two functions are not like terms. It just says f of x equals x squared. And g of x is the square root of x plus 1. So let's combine them together to create a new function. And I want to combine them using the addition operation. Well, all you can really do is that. f of x plus g of x in this case is just x squared plus the square root of x plus 1. So we started with one function and another function, and we combine the two together to create something new. That's all. And we combine them with addition. Let's combine them with division. Right. So to combine them together with division, I have f of x divided by g of x. Now, when they combine together, something happened here that we don't like to leave in the final answer. What, what happened that we normally don't like to leave it like that? Yes, Trevor? We have a square root as the denominator of a fraction. Yeah, and we generally don't like to leave a square root in the bottom. So only because the square root ended up in the bottom, we have to multiply top and bottom by the square root. And that would give us that. x squared times the square root of x plus 1 on the top, and just x plus 1 on the bottom. So in general, we do want to clean up having a square root in the bottom. Any questions on those two examples? So when you have two functions and you combine them together, the first function has its own domain. The second function has its own domain. When you combine them together, the domain is the overlap of the two. So let's say f of x are all the numbers, the domain is all the numbers in that circle. g of x the domain of g of x is all the numbers in that circle. When you combine the two functions together, the domain is the overlap of each of the original domains. So it's in the first one and it's in the second one at the same time. So the domain is all values that belong to both original functions. And I think a, a Venn diagram kind of shows that. Perfect. The only other thing you have to watch out for is when you combine functions using division, you can create a problem where you didn't have one before. Is f of x a fraction? No. Is g of x a fraction? No. So there's no fractions in the originals. But when I combine them together here, now I have a fraction. What are you never allowed to do with a fraction? Yeah. 
Yeah? Divide by zero. Can't divide by zero. So not only do you have to make sure that the domain is in each of the originals, you also have to be careful if you created a function by using division that you didn't introduce a division by zero. If you did, don't let that value be part of your domain. We have to say that that value is not in the domain. And actually, we usually say what is in the domain. We usually don't say what isn't. We usually say what is. All right, so let's look at a um, couple examples of finding domain. So here's the two functions we're going to work with. They each have their own original domain. So we're going to start by finding those. And then we'll add them together and find the new domain. So remember, with square roots, you cannot take the square root of a negative. So what values could you pick for f of x? What values could you pick for x in f of x so that you never end up with the square root of a negative? Zero is OK. Negatives are not. Trevor? Any number that is greater than negative 3? Uh, greater than or equal. But if it was equal to negative 3, it would be 0. Is that negative? Oh, that, OK. Yep. OK, right. so if you plug in negative 3 for x, you get 0. The square root of 0 is perfectly fine to do. No problem with the square root of 0 at all. But you can't take the square root of a negative. 0 is not negative. So that's the domain from the first one, negative 3 up to infinity. How about the domain for my second one? What kind of numbers could I pick there? Um, yeah, uh, Sam? Uh, anything greater than or equal to 2. Anything greater than or equal to 2. So if you want to visualize this on a number line, I think that makes the domain kind of easy to see the overlap. <laughs> The first one um, has a domain from negative 3 to infinity. Actually, it just, just keeps coming. The second one has a domain from 2 to infinity. So now when we do the combining of two functions, the overlap is probably easy to see. Um, maybe you didn't even need the color-coded picture. So, f of x plus g of x. These are not like terms. Okay. For square roots to be like terms, what's under the root has to be the same. Like the square root of 5 plus the square root of 5. That would be 2 square, root, <coughs> excuse me, two square roots of 5. We don't have that here. So all we can do when we write the sum is, is just write the sum. Square root of x plus 3 plus the square root of x minus 2. Now, the domain of this new formula are all numbers that belong to both domains. What are the numbers here that belong to both f of x and g of x? Yep, Anna? Exactly. Anything greater than or equal to 2. That's the overlap. That's what would be shaded in, in both. Okay. Now, let's combine those functions different, but let's do division. Now remember, we've got to be careful because division can introduce a problem that you didn't have to start with, which is dividing by 0. So, f of x divided by g of x f of x divided by g of x. And if we fix it so we don't have a square root in the bottom, you'd multiply top and bottom by the square root of x minus 2. Just like we did earlier. Now, the domain here Similar to the last one, 
It has to be all numbers that are in the domain of f of x and g of x, just like you did before. But we also have to make sure we never divide by 0. So anyone think they can tell me what the domain would be in this one? So what number can we not include this time that we could last time? Two. Two. Two is the number that we can't include because it would cause us to divide by zero. So how would we write our domain this time? So basically everything you had last time except two. Yeah? It's including three to infinity. Is 2.9 okay? Um, yeah, I would say so. So then it's, it wouldn't be 3 to infinity, because we can include 2.9, 2.6, 2.4, 2.21, things like that. Yeah? You would use the parenthesis instead of a bracket, because yeah. you can go up to negative, I mean up to 2, but not equal to it. Yeah. So big difference on this domain. Last time, you could include, um, you could include, um, I don't know why I put a negative on that. Because the overlap is just from 2 to infinity. So the domain on the last one was 2 to infinity. On this one, it's 2 to infinity, not including 2. Meaning you can plug in 2.0001. That's OK. But you can't plug in 2. So any question on, on that one? So when you say it's not including the two, then it's like, you put the parentheses also around the infinity signs are the same, like, because obviously that means that it can go on forever, so it's including all those numbers, so like, what is the actual, like, I guess, definition of the use of the... Can you, sorry, ask your question again? Like, because it doesn't include the two, so does it say with parentheses you say that, does it just mean it's starting off at any number past two? Right, like 2.0000000001. 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, so this is the upper limit of the numbers you can pick that would work. So since infinity has no upper limit, it means you can pick any number from 2 going up forever. It's the same as writing this. x is greater than 2. And the top one would be equivalent to writing x is greater than or equal to 2. Any other question on that? And then when you have a negative infinity, that means there's no lower limit. That means you can go as low as you want. Neither one of these had that. This, this, was, this um, went to infinity, not negative infinity. Uh, let's look at this. So in this case, f of x is just the formula x g of x is the formula absolute value of x. And they've combined them together with division. What's the domain of f of x? What, um, oops, I think I wrote it the other way. f of x is on the top, g of x is on the bottom. What's the domain of f of x? What numbers are you allowed to plug in for x in the top? Yeah? Uh, is it negative infinity to infinity? Yeah, negative infinity to infinity, which means anything. You can plug any number you want into the top. Okay. So this has a domain of all real numbers. What does this have a domain of? What numbers are you allowed to plug in for the letter x? Just looking at what I circled. Yeah? Anything over 0? Uh, so don't look at don't look at the combined function yet. Just this function by itself. Like what number can you plug in for x? Yep. Any number. Any. Right. You can plug anything in for x and take the absolute value. You can plug in anything for x here that you want. But now when we combine them, 
we run into a little bit of a problem. This was all real numbers to begin with. This was all real numbers to begin with. This is not all real numbers. What number are you not allowed to use for x in this one? Yeah, Emma? Zero. Yeah, you can't, you can't use uh, zero. So the way we could write the domain, if you wanted to think of it on a number line, you can use any number going down as low as you want, right up to zero. So that's negative infinity up to zero. That represents this. But you can also go from this number as high as you want. So that represents zero to infinity. But it never included zero in either part. So the way we write this is we put one interval. This symbol means or this interval. So you can pick any number from negative infinity to zero or from zero to infinity. That's writing what the domain is. If you wanted to write what it isn't, you could say all values except zero. But most of the time they ask what the domain is, not what it isn't. Okay. Any question on the domain? Now let's look at the range. Let's try a couple numbers. If you plug 3 in for x, what do you get in the top? Uh, yeah, Kiana? Three. Three? And what do you get in the bottom? Yep. Yeah. Three. Three, which is one. Let's try that number. Let's try like seven. If you plug seven into the top, what do you get? Seven. And what if you plug seven into the bottom? Seven. So you get one again. No matter what positive number you plug in, you're always going to get 1. Let's try a negative. Um, what if you plug negative 4 into the top? What do you get? 4. And what if you plug negative 4 into the bottom? Negative 1. Negative what? I mean negative 4. Negative Sorry. 4. Which is negative, negative, one. Is negative 1. So the range here is very limited. No matter what number you plug in for x, you're always going to get one of two answers. Because you're either going to end up dividing two numbers that are the same, which gives you a 1, or you're going to divide two numbers that are opposites, and that would give you negative 1. So those are the only two numbers that are in the range. When the range is that small, and it only includes two numbers, we can actually make a list of every number in the range. You can't do that when you have something that goes to infinity. You can't possibly list every number from 0 to infinity. You can't even list every number from 0 to 1. But the range is only two values, and this is how you write it. Negative 1 and 1. What that, bracket, what that kind of curved symbol means is what's inside here is a list. That's not a coordinate. That's not an interval. It's a comma-separated list of numbers. And we're writing out every number that's in the range, negative 1 and positive 1. Most of the time, you cannot do this. Because the range, if the range was 0 to infinity, how would you write every single number down? You can't. Yep. Can you only do that if there's two options? Or like if I mean, you, yeah, you could do it if there were like 5 or 6 or 10 or you know 15 options. but. You know, if you have like millions and billions of numbers that are in the range, then you want to write like an interval. Yeah. So most of the time you can't do that. Just right yes. What would the graph about look like? Um, if you graph it, it ends up looking like this. Open circle, this part goes right, another open circle, and this part goes left. That's what it looks like. Any positive number you plug in always comes out to the number 1. Any negative number you plug in always comes out to negative 1. So it's like two rays. And of course, open circles because you can't include 0 because that would be a divide by 0. But you can try it on the calculator. You'll see that's what it looks like. 
So another way we can combine functions together is what's called composition. It's a little bit more advanced way than just adding, subtracting, multiplying, and dividing. The whole idea of composition is you're taking one formula and you're plugging it in for the variable in another formula. That's composition. So instead of plugging in like a single number, if I said to do this, you would plug 2 into function f and tell me the answer. In this case, it would be 7. But we're going to do something like this. Instead of plugging in a number into formula f, we're going to plug in another formula for the variable. And we're going to get that formula from another function. So let's, let's try it. The notation, I kind of gave you a little preview of what it looks like, but it generally looks like this. And that's pronounced g of f of x. So the first thing you want to always do is look at the inside function, go back up, and find the formula for that inside function. The g on the outside just stays right where it is for now. So what is f of x? What's, what's my formula for f of x? Jordan? x squared plus 3. x squared plus 3. So what they want me to do in this one is take x squared plus 3 and plug that into formula g. So I'm going to look up formula g. Everywhere I see a variable, I'm going to replace it with x squared plus 3. So here's formula g. The square root of, and now replace the variable with what they want you to plug in, x squared plus 3. And that's called composition. You just plugged in this entire formula for that variable. Now let's try it the other way. We can also take this formula and fill it in for that variable. That's doing it the other way. So this is f of g of x. So keep the letter on the outside. And now look up what they want you to plug into formula f. They want me to plug in g of x. Go look up what g of x is. Square root of x. So they want me to plug square root of x into formula f. Look up formula f right here. Everywhere that you see a variable in formula f, you are going to replace it with what they told me to plug in. And they told me to plug in what's in the parentheses, square root of x. So you would have, instead of x squared plus 3, we're going to fill in what we want inside that box square root of x. And what, what happens there? Last time when we did that, we were done. But this time, we actually can take one more step here. Sam? Uh, you could, uh, when you square the square root, it just turns into an x. And what does it turn into? Uh, an x. x. And that's the final answer. x plus 3. Questions on that? I'll try a couple more. That that's called composition. Another notation you might see in the book. I'm not going to use it though on the on the um, on the test. Is this G with a little circle and then an F? This means that. 
Okay, but I always um, I always stick with the notation on the right. You don't have to worry too much about that notation. So, when you compose functions, each function that you started with had its own domain. When you put them together, you've messed with that domain. So now we want to figure out what, how do you find the domain when you compose functions. Uh, there's two steps. The first step is we're going to look at the inside function. It's something like this. I would consider g of x to be the inside function. So you start with that, and we eliminate any values that don't appear in the domain of the inside function. Whatever you're left with are the values that are in the domain of the inside function. So that's the first step. Figure out any values that should not be part of the domain of the inside function. The second step is look at the composed function. That's the final answer. Are there any values there that you shouldn't have? When I say shouldn't have, I mean are there values that could cause you to divide by zero? If there are, get rid of them. Are there values that could cause you to take the square root of a negative? If there are, get rid of them. And the reason you have to look at the original inside function and the final answer is because if you go back to the last problem we did, and I'll, I'll put this right back up, but if you look at the final answer here, x plus 3, are there any square roots in that final answer? No. Did you have a square root when you started? You can't forget that you did. That's important. You had a square root as part of the inside function, which automatically limits you to numbers 0 and higher. Just because that square root canceled out in the final answer doesn't mean we can forget about it. So you might look at the final answer and say, oh, it's all real numbers. You can take any number you want and add 3. That's true. But you have to think back about how did you get that? What did it come from? Okay, and it came from this. All right. So we've got two functions. And what we'll do on this is let's just try plugging in a number, just to start. Sometimes if composition doesn't make sense for some people, trying it with a number rather than a letter makes more sense. So let's find f of g of 9. What would you do first to figure this out? Would it be something involving formula f or formula g? Jordan? You'd solve formula G for uh, G of 9 first. Yeah, we're going to forget about the F. And what we're going to do is plug 9 into formula G. So plug 9 into formula G. That gives me 3. Now plug that result into the next formula on the outside. And we keep working our way out. You could have h of f of g, or you could have as many of these as you want. But you start on the inside, work your way out. So now f of 3 is 3 plus 1. Any question on that? And it's just a numerical example that shows what composition is. Try another one with letters. 
f of g of x. Okay, um, Hannah, what is g of x? Yep, so we're going to replace g of x with the square root of x, and now that tells me what to fill into formula f. Look at formula f. Everywhere that you have the variable, change it to square root of x. Um, so Sean, can you tell me what uh, my final answer would look like? It would look like square root of x plus 1. Square root of x plus 1. Just like that. Let's try it the other way. G of f of x. So, um, Brianna, what um, what is f of x again? X plus one. X plus one. So, in formula G, replace that with what's in the parentheses. X plus one. Um, Lindsay, if I do that. Uh, what would I get for my final answer? Um, Just like this? I uh, know. Is the one in the square root? Exactly. Big difference. Any question on that? Okay. Uh, I don't think we're going to do both of these, but let's do let's do it one way. Um, let's do let's, let's, you can write down the f and the g. I'm just thinking which way I want to compose it. Um, let's do f of g of x. Let's do the second one. And again, I'll I'll just stick with this notation. So find f of g of x. And the domain. Okay. So we'll start with the inside function. Um, Andrew, what is g of x? Square root of x. So now look at formula f and replace the variable with what's in the parentheses. Formula f is x squared minus 1. So I replaced the variable. It wasn't x. I replaced it with square root of x. And what does that simplify to? Um, just uh, x, minus one. x minus 1. Now, Let's find the domain. That's the answer to the composition. Well, let's find the domain. Start with the inside function, g of x. Is there any restriction on the domain of g of x, just the original function you started? Yep, Sebastian. It can't be a negative. Can you tell me what it can be? Any positive number? Um, and zero. And zero. So just uh, any number from zero to infinity. That's what g of x limits you to. So you're already limited to being between zero and infinity because of the inner function. Now look at the final answer. What numbers are you allowed to subtract one from? Yeah, crazy. Any? Any. So the final answer doesn't add anything to the restrictions. There are no restrictions in the final answer, but there was a restriction in the original inside function, and that was from 0 to infinity. So the domain here is only 0 to infinity. So we keep the restrictions from the first one? Yes. Okay. Almost think of this as like a, like a filter. It goes through the first filter. All right, and we eliminated everything that wasn't zero to infinity, 
Now, looking at what's left, is there another filter we have to apply here? Kind of think of it that way. So this might filter out some values, and sometimes this might filter out even more values. In this case, it didn't. Um, so for range, the easiest way to find range is to graph it on the calculator and look at how high and low it goes. All right, um, let's just do one. Last time we did, we did f of g. So let's do g of f this time. So find g of f of x and the domain and range. Okay, start with domain. Actually, let's start by finding the composition first. What's going to go inside my parentheses? Square root of x. And now, can anyone tell me if you plug the square root of x into formula g, what do you get? Huh? Square root of x minus 3. Square root of x minus 3. Like this, or should the 3 be underneath it? Like that. 3 is not. Um, underneath it. Okay, so let's go through our domain and range. F of x. Are there any restrictions on the domain of this formula that I just circled? Yep. Yeah. Can't, Can't be negative, so it can be 0 to infinity. So we're already limited to 0 to infinity. Now let's look at the final answer. Are there any restrictions on what I circled? What the blue boxes around. Yep. Can you say it again? Yeah, it's nothing we don't already have. It's the same restriction again. So this is limited to being 0 to infinity. This is limited to being 0 to infinity. That doesn't add anything new. So the domain here is 0 to infinity. Now the range, we're going to graph that on the calculator and see how high and low it goes. So the square root of x minus 3. Make sure you hit the right arrow to get out of that square root because you don't want the 3 under it. Zoom, 6. So remember, this is half of a parabola. That's what the shape is. We already know it starts at 0, and it goes to the right forever. That's the domain. But what's the lowest value on the y-axis and the highest value? Yep, Caitlin? Um, zero. Um, so you're saying that it, it stops right here? Yeah, it's going to keep going. Remember, range doesn't mean what you can see on the screen. It means if you could zoom out forever, what would you see? This would just keep going, right? It's, it's really a parabola shape, and the parabola just gets wider and wider and wider. So it will keep going up forever. So the range, the lowest y value you ever get is negative 3, and the highest is infinity. Any question on that? So, let's take a look at yeah, it's kind of what we did before, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you the composition, and I want you to tell me what the original function would have been to get them. So it's not composing, I'm not going to give you two functions to compose. I'll give you one function, 
I'll give you the answer when you compose them. I want you to tell me the other function. And sometimes there's more than one answer. So you can kind of think of this as a vertical stretch. You're multiplying by a number in front. I want to know how could you get this? And I'll give you one of the functions. The inner function is x squared. So think of it this way. I want to know what I would have to plug. I want to know what formula g is. That's the question. What could you write down for formula g so that when you plug x squared into it, you end up with ax squared. You want to see, Jordan? G of x equals a times x. Yeah. G of x equals a times x. Now, if you filled x squared in for the variable in formula g, you would end up a x squared. All right. So it just takes, you just kind of have to think about it a little bit. It's like you're working backwards to figure out what did you start with to get that. All right, let's try this one. Remember, f of x is given to you. That's x squared. So the question is, what is this? What could you plug x squared into? and end up with the result x squared plus k is the final answer. This is an example of like a vertical shift. You've added a number on the end. Yep, can I go ahead? Is it x plus k? Yep, it's x plus k. If you plugged in x squared into formula g, you'd be replacing the x with x squared and you would end up with x squared plus k. So that, that's the answer. Um, I don't know if I want to do this. Not worry about that. OK. So yesterday, we learned that if you write this, that's a vertical shift of 3, because you added a number on the end. It actually doesn't matter what you put right there. If you take any formula and put a plus 3 on the end, it will shift it up 3. So like if you had a square root, and we've seen some kind of like this today, and you do a plus 3 on the end, that's the square root function shifted up 3. So what I'm going to do now is just kind of generalize everything we learned yesterday, but not just to a parabola, but to anything. So let's look at um, how do I do this. Let's do it this way. So if you take a function and multiply by a number in front, like this, what does multiplying by a number in front do to something? Yep. Stretch it. Which way? Uh, Vertically. Vertically. And that just doesn't apply to x squared, but you could do that with square root. You could do that with any formula we're going to learn all year. If you multiply by a number in front, the new formula you get is a vertical stretch of the old one. Um, how about if you add or subtract a number on the end of a function? Any function. What does adding and subtracting do? Yeah? Up and down. It will shift it up and down. What if you have a formula and you add a number on the inside? Which way does adding on the inside move it? Anna? Uh, adding would be which way? Say it again. Um, let's try the other option. Left. So adding would move it left, subtracting would move it right. Uh, negative. 
So negative causes it to flip or reflect. Does anyone remember when you put the negative in the front? This is what we did yesterday. What kind of reflection is that when it's all the way in the front? We didn't really do this other one yesterday because with a parabola you can't tell because of the symmetry. I'll mention it right now, but we didn't do the bottom one yesterday. We did the top one. Yeah? It's a reflection on the x-axis. Yep, a reflection over the x-axis, which is a vertical reflection. When you put the negative on the inside, that's a mirror image or reflection on the y-axis. Okay, so the last thing I'm going to give you is a picture, and I just want you to apply um, transformations to it. It's not going to be a formula. It's, it's going to be an image. I'll show you what I mean. So here's your image. Um, you can try to make it a little bigger if you can't see it. I don't know what shape it is. It's kind of like a, it's got a line segment going from the point 0, 2 to 4, 0. And then it's got a curve going from negative 2, 0 up to 0, 2. I want to do, uh, I got to zoom out a little bit. I want to do this to it. So remember the order that we always do transformations in. Start on our inside with any shifting left and right. Work your way outside to vertical stretches. And you end with vertical shifts. Start on the inside. What is that x plus 1 going to do to my shape? It's an addition on the inside of a function. So it it's up there. Ava? It's going to shift left one. So I'm going to take, I'm actually going to go like this. Let's make a copy of this shape. Let's put it down here. I think it was right there. Um, no, it was further over. Ah, I'll just draw it by hand. It's too long. I think it's here, 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 something like that. So that was the original shape. And now to shift it left one, that point would go there, that point would go there, that point would go there. That's an example of shifting left one. Now, what's the two going to do? So that's multiplying by a number in front. What does multiplying by a number in front do? Just vertical stretch. It's a vertical stretch. Um, vertical would affect which values, x's or y's? Uh, x's or horizontal. So this would affect your y's. Vertical stretch by a factor of how much? Two. What that means is you double the y value of every coordinate. You keep the x values the same. This coordinate has a y value of 0. What do you get if you double it? Zero. It stays right where it is then. This coordinate has a y value of 2. What if you double that? Now it's up at 4. This coordinate also has a y value of 0. It stays right where it is. So in green is a vertical stretch of the red one by a factor of 2. And then the last thing is minus 3. What's the minus 3 going to do to the shape in green? Yep? Move it down 3. Move it down 3. So. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. That's the green shape. 
moved down uh, three units. Right. So that's that's all that that is. It's applying transformations, but there was no formula. It was just an image. All right. Um, let me put up the homework. Um, give you guys a second to copy that down. Uh, I think what I'll do is I'll put the topics for the test on the board right after you copy the homework. All right, so these are a list of the topics that are on the test tomorrow. So finding the equation of a line given two points, finding the slope of a line given two points, finding the equations of vertical and horizontal lines, uh, evaluate a value by plugging it into a function, including evaluating a composition, uh, finding the domain and range. There will be several questions uh, about that. Find the equation of parallel and perpendicular lines. So you could be given uh, a line, and I could say find a line parallel to a given line going through a certain point, or perpendicular to a given line going through a certain point. Um, if I give you a list of transformations, you should be able to tell me the equation of a, of a line uh, or of a parabola. Uh, determine if something is a function that involves looking if it passes the vertical line test. And find the equation of a parabola if I give you a point and a line of symmetry. So being multiple choice, uh, if you have a point, you can verify that the point works uh, by plugging it in. And then the line of symmetry will give you a hint at if there's been a horizontal shift left or right. 